Right, can you please open your Bibles? Trust you've got them with you. Just open them. Okay, okay. Open them to the book of Hebrews, please. So, so what we need to do over the next couple of, uh, next couple of weeks, I'd really like to try and get our Victory Church Credoc sign put up on this gable up here. So uh, we need to try and do that. Uh, we need some creative people. So please talk to Jeannie or myself um, or to any of the core leaders um, if you've got some, something that you'd like to contribute towards the sign, um, maybe some design ideas, colors you might think this look, might look good. So why don't you just submit or give or come and talk to us about colors, what you think it can look like. I know we've got a logo. There it is at the bottom right-hand side, uh, Victory Church with a cross in it and the V, um, which we'll probably put that up. Um, and, then, and then the rest, but colors, what does the sign look like? Uh, we'd love to do a sign on the gable. And then we'd also like to do a kind of a drop-down sign that says Community Hub with an arrow. And in the Community Hub, we've got a Jelly Tots room. That's for the one to three-year-old kids. Who used to be one to three-year-olds? We all were, eh? Yeah. So we all know what that's like, eh? Um, and we have amazing adjectives that we can use for kids in that age group, eh? And then we've got the first, uh, the, 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 the little fish is the room for our kids between, help me ladies and gentlemen please, between age of five and eight, I think it is. Somewhere around there. Jacqueline, am I right? I think so. I think she's half nodding at me, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking for someone to support me here. And then we've got the drifters. Those are the kids drifting between primary school and high school. So it's kind of from the age of 8 or 9 to 13, 14, junior primary school. Does that make sense? And so we want to have a drop-down board that says, and then we'd like to, to uh, another sign we need to make is the Hebrews Cafe. So it'll be he dash brews, like brewing coffee, but Hebrews, which we're going to be preaching out of today. So, so it's kind of a double whammy, which is quite nice. So we need to do a sign that goes up here on the gable. We need to do a little drop-down board, and we need to do Hebrews Cafe um, in the community hub. So anybody's got ideas and thoughts, please come and talk to us. And if you do want to do an EFT transfer and, and, and contribute to it financially, please just write there, signage. If you do that, and then we know, okay, this X amount that you would like to contribute can go towards the signage. Is that good? So we'd like to put a sign on the gable, a drop down, and Hebrews Cafe. That's where we came with Hebrews. You like it, eh? eh? Very nice, Garth. Okay, cool. So you all in the book of Hebrews? Okay, so a little bit of context. Nobody really, really, really knows who wrote the book of Hebrews. A lot of people think it was Paul. Some think it was Paul and some of the guys that were with him, Apollos and, and other guys. But nobody, if you go back into history and if you look at Bible scholars, nobody really, really, really knows who, who wrote it. But what you and I do know is that it was inspired by Holy Spirit. That we do know. And so the book of Hebrews and who it was written to, we could only guess it was the Jews. Hebrews, not those who drink coffee. And no smiles, and no laughs, eh? Eh? Is it cold? <laughs> is that what it is, Cora? Okay. I'm going to move the heater to you guys. Remember, I love feedback, eh? I love to hear feedback from you guys. So, where was I? Hebrews. Hebrews. <laughs> so nobody really knows who the book of Hebrews was written to. Obviously, we know it was written to us. It was written to Christians all over the world. We understand that. A lot of Paul's letters and the letters in the New Testament will say, to the church in Coloss, in Coloss um, and all the brethren and brothers in Christ throughout the world. Often it will open with that kind of scripture, with that kind of verse or reference. So we know the book of Hebrews was written to us. But in context, it was probably written to Jews and, uh, and Jews that were scattered around Europe. Are you in the book of Hebrews? Good. Can I please ask you to go to chapter 
8. I want to talk a little bit this morning. So it was quite funny. Eh? Well, for me it was funny anyway. I said to the Lord on, on, uh, during the week, I said, Father, can I just have a, like a normal preach today? Maybe one on, on joy. I don't know. Just, just like a normal preach that I can like, maybe I can even make us laugh. You know, and I was saying, how about just a, a normal preach? Maybe you'll just, Father, give me a topic, something that I can use, and I can just share it with everybody, and we can all go home and like, hey, this is great. And God said, no, no, there's something I want you to teach again this morning. And I've been teaching, and it feels like it, and I'm telling you now, it's hard work to teach. But I feel like I've been teaching for six weeks or two months, and I haven't really given you a preach on a topic. But again, this morning, I just felt God wanting to highlight the old and the new covenant. And what does it mean to you and I? Please understand that, that my preaching and teaching is never a fully exhaustive um, uh, expose of old covenant to new covenant. I'm, I've got 30 minutes, maybe 40 minutes, to try and give you some kind of overview. And I'm asking you, as I, as I often do, to take the notes, watch the YouTube again if you need to, but study it again for yourself to get a complete picture in your own heart. Because when revelation comes to you and I personally, not only do we adopt it, but we start to live it. And that's what is critical, is that you and I start to live the Word of God. Jody, can you go to that slide for me, please? So there's a couple of, uh, and I'm going to read from the book of Hebrews in a moment. And you can see in the middle, Hebrews 8 verse 7 says, If the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant. Hebrews 8 verse 7. If you look on the left, old covenant was righteousness by law. On the right hand side, the new covenant is the righteousness of Christ. Not your righteousness, not mine. The covenant wasn't established because of your and my good works. It was established because of Christ's righteousness. Then if you look on the left and on the right, and I'm going to go one, one, left and right as we go down. First one, in the old covenant, it was the blood of animals. Remember, every year, a priest would go in and slaughter a sheep without blemish, without spot, for the, for the atonement of sin for the whole of mankind. But in the new covenant, it is written in the blood of Jesus. If you remember the songs we were singing early on this morning, and the songs are always strategically chosen to complement the word that we are preaching. So if we have understand in the old covenant, it was the blood of animals. In the new covenant, the blood of Christ. I absolutely love this song, and I've got to try and think of the exact words now. It says that, when the blood of Jesus started to flow, and if you guys can recall, we're singing it, when the blood of Jesus started to flow, which means it has not stopped flowing, which means it still flows for redemption of mankind even today. Isn't that beautiful? So blood of animals versus the blood of Jesus Christ. Number two, in the old covenant was written on stone. Moses, up on the mountain, written on stone, Ten Commandments came down. In the New Covenant, it is written on the hearts of men and women. The New Covenant is written on your heart. Isn't that amazing? It's a beautiful picture. Number three, the Old Covenant was a shadow, and the New Covenant has substance. Number four, it was glorious. The New Covenant is even more glorious because it's not based on my behavior or my works. Number five, it had an end in the Old Covenant. In the New Covenant, it has no end. Number six, it was the law of Moses, but now in the New Covenant, it is the law of the Messiah. Who's the Messiah? Jesus, correct. It is the law of Jesus Christ. Number seven, it was the law of works in the Old Covenant, where I had to work for my salvation. In the new covenant, it is the law of faith. Believing for what I can't see. The law of faith. 
And that's what often blows people's minds. They don't know how to comprehend faith correctly. Then on on the left-hand side, number eight, it was the law of sin and death. There was death. In the new covenant, it is the law of the spirit of life. Number nine was many sacrifices had to be made. In the new covenant, only one sacrifice was made, Jesus, once and for all. Never ever having to go through that again. Number 10, the old covenant was powerless to save. In number 10, on the new covenant, it is powerful to save. The new covenant is powerful to save. Number 11 on the old covenant was annual atonement. On on the new covenant, it is eternal. You are saved once, forgiven once for all. You don't have to go through it every year. You don't have to come and repent every Sunday because you did something wrong during the week. We've got to change the way we think. We're not living in the old covenant. We're living under the new covenant written in the blood of Jesus. Number 12, it is an earthly tabernacle. Remember how God gave Moses a design of how to build the, the tabernacle? It was a tent of meeting. We know about the Ark of the Covenant, acacia wood, the two cherubim angels. The, the, you know that part, of, well, I'm just digressing a little bit here. I absolutely love that part where, where the cherubim angels on the Ark of the Covenant, they had their wings spread like this. This is what they looked like. It was an eagle and it had its like an eagle and an angel, and it had its wings spread like this. The Bible says that when God told Moses what to do, he said, I want you to take each angel must be hammered out of a single piece of gold. Can you just imagine that? I don't know if there's anybody that can physically do that today. Take a piece of gold and hammer it into the shape of an angel and its wings like this, cherubim. And so there's two. That was just a point by and by. Just out of interest anyway. Hammered, I tell you, sometimes I feel like my life is hammered out of a piece of gold. Isn't that true? Doesn't that feel like it for you and I sometimes? Earthly tabernacle in number 12 in the new covenant, it is a heavenly tabernacle. And I'll go through it in a few minutes time. But the heavenly tabernacle was not made by human hands. It was made by God. There's a massive difference here, guys. And then number 13, on the Old Covenant, it was a ministry of death. Number 13, in the New Covenant, it is a ministry of life. Why would we not want to live in the New Covenant? Eh? Old Covenant, number 14, it was from the flesh. Works, performance-based. Have I, have I not? Am I, am I not? In the New Covenant, number 14, it's an inner reality of Holy Spirit living in me, done, finished, over. And number 15, it was a ministry of condemnation. Old Covenant, we always felt condemned and guilty. But in the New Covenant, it is a ministry of reconciliation. And we sang about it earlier on, about how Father has reconciled us to Himself by the blood of Jesus. Jody, could you switch it off for a moment, please? And I might ask you to pop it up again. When you and I look at that list of the left and the right and the old and the new, this is a rhetorical question, so I'm not asking you for feedback right now. Why do we still live with one foot in the old covenant? Law-based? Why do we still feel condemnation when we do something wrong? Why do we still feel guilty at times and we stand with one foot in the, in the new covenant and we sing, thank you, Jesus, for your blood. Thank you for your sacrifice on the cross. You and I need to shift our minds, changing the way we think. Because, friends, you and I do not live according to the Old Testament. We live according to the New Testament. A testament is a covenant. We don't live according to the old covenant any longer. We live according to the new covenant. It means a shift in our minds, a shift in my imagination, and the shift in my thinking. And that's why I say, take what I'm preaching, take what I'm giving you, and go home and continue to do a study so that you get a full 
holistic picture of what does it look like for you now to live in the new covenant. You're still in Hebrews chapter 8. I'm going to read a little bit. And we're going to go from... Uh, we're going to jump around a little bit. So if you've got your Bibles open, you can go read with me. Chapter 8 from verse 1. I love this. Here is the main point. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. I, uh, I change Bibles quite often just because I want to get a complete picture on my, on my desk. I've got New Living Translation, King James. I've got the NIV. Um, I've got some concordances and I've got some references and, and I go through a whole lot of them. But right now, I've, just, I've also got the message and I've also got the passion and I love them all. And uh, right now, I'm just thoroughly enjoying the New Living Translation. It's got a uh, there's, there's just something for me that, that ministers to me in, in the, the English that it uses, um, kind of today's English. It's a new living translation. So let us read. That might sound a little bit different in yours if you're reading a different version. But chapter 8, verse 1, goes like this. Here is the main point. If you were here last week or if you watched the video, I spoke about Jesus Christ, our high priest, last weekend. Here is the main point. We have a high priest. Jesus Christ, who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. That's where Jesus is. There he ministers in a heavenly tabernacle, the true place of worship that was built by the Lord, not by human hands. You see the distinction between Old and New Covenant again? Please go down to verse 6 for me. Now Jesus, our high priest, has been given a ministry that is far superior to the old priesthood. So Jesus' ministry is more superior than the old ministry. For he is the one who mediates for us a better covenant with God. I, I want to run ahead of myself, and I'm going to come back to a couple of points. But the promises in the new covenant is based on better promises. So not the old covenant promises, better promises. If the first covenant, and we read that earlier on, if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no need for a second covenant to replace it. But when God found fault with the people, how's that? Not his covenant, he found fault with the people. That's when he said, a day is coming when I will make a new covenant, a new deal a new contract. Go down to verse 13, please. That's the last verse of chapter 8. When God speaks of a new covenant, it means it has made the first one obsolete. Obsolete means outdated, discarded, and discontinued. Isn't that amazing? Hebrews 8, 13. The old covenant, the first one, is obsolete. It is now out of date and will soon disappear. Isn't that amazing? Why do we still live with one foot in Old Covenant and one foot in the New? Because we don't really understand. You remember a couple of weeks ago where Jesus says that the mistake we make is that we don't know the Scriptures. Remember that? And again, the same thing here. Chapter 8, verse 13. The Old Covenant is obsolete, outdated, discarded, discontinued, we now live in the new covenant written in Jesus' blood. Please, one more section, two verses, chapter 9, verse 11 and verse 12. Are you there? Are you there? Great. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which is not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Oh, come on. How to get yourself knotted. 
secured our redemption forever. Which simply means, friends, that you and I do not have to go through repentance every week if we make a mistake. We don't have to do that anymore. Old Testament, yep, made a mistake, got to go repenting. I'm not, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a clear understanding and a difference here between repentance and forgiveness. Repentance means change the way I think. Forgiveness is to say, God, I'm sorry I did this silly thing. I'm not going to do it again. I'm going to change the way I think. And I'm going to run forward with you now under the new, new covenant and a new understanding. So as followers of Jesus Christ, we have to make the mental switch from the old covenant to the new covenant. David Buffalo says it this way, and I quite enjoy the way he says it. He says, the old covenant, with all its sacrifices, rituals, laws, decrees, and festivals, and all the old covenant stuff, boils down to this. Love the God that you cannot see. Love the human that God created that you can see. I want you to look at a human next to you and say, I love you. Corinne and Des, you know how to say it to each other. Des, look at Melissa and tell her that. Yeah. Corinne, tell Celia that you love her. Okay, now I'm going to ask you one more thing. Close your eyes for a moment, please. Really, please close your eyes. I want you to see some person that you're struggling with right now. You might be having a problem with a person on your farm, a person in your business, family member, whoever it is. See that person. Picture that person in your mind, in your imagination. You see that person? Say to them now, I love you. That person that is giving you a hard time, rebellious kid, whatever it is, close your eyes, say to them, see them, picture them, say to them, I love you. can open your eyes again. David Buffalo continues, he says, if you loved God in the Old Covenant, then you did what he said. You did the impossible things for God. And you can picture some of the guys like David killing Goliath, the impossible things that he did for God. He, you also did the hard things for God under the Old Covenant. If you've read the book of Jeremiah, you know that he had to lie on his left side for two years. That's a hard thing. Can you imagine that? Are you serious? Did you really hear from God? No, no, but you must be mistaken. Did God really tell you to lie on your left-hand side for two years? And then when he's finished those two years, God says to him, okay, now lie on your right-hand side for two years. Old covenant. When you loved God, you did what he said. You did the hard things. And you did whatever God said. Why? Because you loved God. Old covenant. But if you broke the contract of love, then you lost the blessing. Old covenant. If you broke the contract of love, you lost the blessing. As hard as man has tried to follow the old covenant, it seems no one could quite keep it. No one. Not even David. Not even Moses. Not even Aaron. Nobody could keep it. Why? Why is it so difficult to maintain or to keep the old covenant? Because the contract is dependent on the heart of both parties. There's three things we know about the heart. Number one is God's heart is pure. Always, forever. It is pure. God will always easily keep a contract. And the third part is that man's heart is corrupt. And so if there's ever any fault in not upholding agreements and deals and contracts and covenants, it's man's fault, not God's fault. Interesting. The old covenant is thinking that God is out there. I need to obey. I need to follow the laws strictly so that I might be blessed. Old covenant. I need to go to a prophet to hear what God is saying. Sometimes I need to go to somebody and inquire from God, please, on my behalf. If you consider that... Um, Saul, you went to people to say, what is God saying? Old covenant. But if we switch our thinking from old covenant to new covenant, new covenant is God is with me. Now the Bible says that he will never leave you 
nor forsake you. And God is not a liar. He is pure in everything. And so when he says, I'll never leave you, he'll never leave you. Even if you've done something wrong in the last week, he does not withdraw from you or move himself away from you and say, I don't want anything to do with Shireen until she repents again. God doesn't do that in the new covenant. I have the mind of Christ. Please say that to yourself. I have the mind of Christ. Say it again. I have the mind of Christ. That is what you have. I have his spirit that leads me and guides me. And I love this part. As I fill myself with the word of God, and when I exhorted and encouraged you this year to read the word, get this thing into your heart and into your spirit. As I fill myself with the word of God, listen to this, the more God has to work with me. Because all of a sudden I've got fresh revelation, I understand right from wrong, and now he can work with me. So it's critical that you and I know this in our advance, in our now growth in knowing him. Remember I spoke about a difference between relationship with God and fellowship with him? If you want to have fellowship with Jesus, know the word. Get this into your spirit and into your life and into your heart. Guys, it can take us five minutes. You know, it takes you two hours to read the book of Luke. That's all. That's all it takes, two hours to read the book of Luke. Isn't that amazing? So it doesn't take you, but it takes you a lifetime to know it. So I can read it in two hours, which is a good thing, because the Holy Spirit starts to reveal truth in me. But then I take the Word of God, and as we've been preaching, and even as I've been trying to model it in the past, we take a book and we study it over and over. And for a month we preached on the book of Mark. Remember? And then we looked at Romans, and for about three weeks we spoke on Romans and certain parts of it. Now we're looking at Hebrews. We did last week. We're doing it now. I don't know what's going to happen next week. But right now we're just taking the Word of God, the meat of the Word of God, and we're just digesting it and chewing on it and understanding it and saying, God, I want that in here, and I want to live by your Word. And then 1 Thessalonians 2.13, the Word of God is active in me. And as I read more, God can work more in me. Isn't that amazing? As I, so I'm going to give you a couple of truths on the New Covenant, on the New Testament. Hebrews 8 verse 6 is a critical verse. You and I read it a few minutes ago. And I want to make sure that you and I understand this, that the covenant, the New Testament, the new covenant God made is between Jesus and God, not between you and us and God. How's that? He did not make a new covenant with you and I. Because we morally cannot uphold covenant. It's been proven. But God made a covenant with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? And the Bible says, and I know I'm running ahead of my notes, but I've got these question marks all over your faces again, and I like to see that. The first thing you've got to understand is that God made covenant between Jesus and himself, not between you and I, which means you and I can never break covenant because it wasn't established with us. Isn't that good? But the Bible also tells me, and I'm going to read it for you now, that you and I, when I say yes to Jesus and I understand the severity of my sin and that the only way I can have redemption and be reconciled to the Father is through the blood of Jesus, when I understand that and I put up my hand and I say, Jesus, please forgive me. I want to be part of your family and I want to be in your kingdom. At that moment, the Bible says, I am hidden in Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? So we need to see where we are seated. So I am hidden in Christ Jesus. You know that when God looks at you and I, He sees Jesus. He doesn't see the mistakes you've made in the last week. He doesn't see the errors and the sin and the bad thoughts you've even had. He sees Jesus. Because it is the righteousness of Jesus that saves you and I, not our own works. Otherwise, we're going to go back into the old covenant and say, oh, I did bad this week. Therefore, I've got to repent and say, sorry again, Lord. Is that making sense? So it's critical to understand that the covenant was made between God and Jesus, not between God and man, because we failed miserably in the first one. Very good. Hebrews 9, 11 to 14 says that the new covenant is written in the blood of Jesus. Not by animals, not by goats, not by you and I. No, no, nothing that we can do. It is written in the blood of Jesus. Once 
for all. So it brings back that topic, and you can ask me the question if you want to. Is it true that once saved, always saved? Of course it is. Can anything snatch you out of God's hand? No. Once saved, always saved. Does that therefore then give me a license to just do what I want to do? No. Of course not. So we live according to the word. And that's why I say to you, for you and I to understand how to live our life morally that brings ple- that is pleasing to God and brings Him glory, know the Word, so that we know how to deal with every single situation we face. God will reveal it to you and I in His Word. So Hebrews 9.11 to 14 is that the covenant is written in the blood of Jesus. We are hidden in Christ Jesus, as I was saying a bit earlier on, Colossians 3 verse 3. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. That's got to change the way you and I think. That we have died to this life. This life here on earth, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Where am I? I'm hidden in Christ forever and for always. And I function from this place. We are co-heirs with Jesus Christ, Romans 8.17 tells us. Together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. What have you not done to deserve to be heirs? Nothing. You understand that Jesus did everything, and it's like a free gift. He's saying, I've done it all. Yeah, it's yours for free. And yet we want to live in the Old Testament. So you might ask me, what's an Old Testament for then? Why was it written? Why is it there? If I'm not gonna, of course there are aspects of the, of the Old Testament. The, the 33 books in the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Of course those that we learn and we live by. But there's also a whole lot of things that we, that we understand how people did things in the Old Testament. So I look at David as an example how he followed God wholeheartedly. Yes, he made mistakes, but he followed God and he did what God... I look at Elijah. I look at Elisha. I look at the minor prophets, Amos. I look at the guys and I say, all of them, even up to the Italian prophet. I've got one or two people hearing me this morning. Malachi, Malachi, Italian prophet. And that's a joke, okay? So, I want to make sure you're awake. I just want to make sure you're awake, that you're listening to me. And so we look at the Old Testament, we learn from what they did and how they responded and what they did. But I'm not going to go through the rituals and the decrees and the laws of Moses and the old time. I'm not going to do those things anymore. I'm going to tell you why in a few minutes. time. Hebrews 8.11, another truth about New Covenant, is that we know God because He has put His laws in our hearts and on our minds. That's what it says in Rome, in, in Hebrews chapter 8. He says, I will put my law in their mind and I will write it on their hearts. You remember we were singing a song earlier on and even that we speak, and I think Stephen was praying it, that the word of God is written on the tablet of my heart. You remember that? Remember a couple of weeks ago, I was also talking about the corrupt heart of man and how God must take out this heart of stone and give me a heart of flesh. Remember that story? So the Bible says that God takes his word now and he writes it on my heart and in my mind, which means you and I have a conscience of good and bad, right and wrong. And where does that conscience come from? God. He put it in your heart and in your mind. Isn't that amazing? Not just because you were born and because we people. No, no, God put it there. Hebrews 8 verse 10 says, uh, and I love this one, it says God promised that Israel and Judah would be under the new covenant. God promised that. You can read it in Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10. It says that God promised Israel and Judah will be under the new covenant. You know that it hasn't happened yet. You know that. Because Israel today largely rejects the Christ that God sent. We know that. So that hasn't been done yet. But 
the Lord has grafted in the Gentiles, which is you and I, non-Jews. He has grafted us in to his family. And he says that in John 15, verse 1 to 8, I am the true vine, and you have been grafted into the vine. That means I am no longer an orphan. I am no longer separated from God. I am now part of his family. He has adopted me. He has brought me into his family. He has grafted me in. And my name is written on his hand. Nothing can snatch me from his hand any longer. It's a privilege that you and I have as people. What have you done to deserve it? Shake your heads. Nothing. Absolutely. So what does Hebrews say about my responsibility under the new covenant? When no salvation is not by works, what is my responsibility in the new covenant? I'm glad you asked the question. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22, gives us a clue of what our responsibility is in the new covenant. The first, first responsibility you and I have is to draw near to God. He says, draw near to me. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting Him. Trust is an absolutely critical part of the new covenant. I was talking about it earlier about faith, how mankind struggles with faith to believe something that they cannot see. And yet you and I are called under the new covenant to live by faith, fully trusting God. If you've had a word that has been spoken over your life, over your family, over your business, over your farm, whatever it might be, you hold on to that word because that is the truth that God has spoken over you and over your family and over your situation. Even if you have to wait 20, 30, 40 years, you hold on to that truth. Sometimes the testing is in holding on to truth for a sustained period of time where it's so easy just to give up. The next one is Hebrews 10 verse 23. What is my responsibility in the new covenant? It says, let us hold tightly without wavering to hope. You and my responsibility in the new covenant is to hold tightly onto hope. What is it that we're hoping for? What is it that we're hoping for? Eternal life with Jesus. That is what I hope for. Do I hope for a better house and a better car and a better job and a better while I'm here? No. Those things are irrelevant. What I am hoping for is eternal life with Christ, where the creation is made new, and you and I will rule and reign with Jesus Christ forever. That is my hope, and that is what we hope for. I don't hope for gold teeth and gold dust and... I'm not knocking those things. Don't get me wrong. But that's not where my hope is. My hope is in the law of the Lord. I'm not going back to Old Covenant to understand my words I'm using. But my hope is in His Word. My hope is in Him. My hope is in eternal life with Jesus. That's what I'm hoping for. Hebrews 10 verse 24, the next one says, Let us think of ways, and I love this, what is your and my responsibility in the New Covenant? Let us think of ways to motivate one another. So all of a sudden, the new covenant is not a selfish thing where I just sit at home and I make sure I'm, I'm okay, Jack. And I come here on a Sunday and I preach and I hope that you guys are okay and forget about the rest. No, 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 no. The Bible says my responsibility and your responsibility under the new covenant is to motivate one another. And to what? What do we motivate each other for? To acts of love and good works. Isn't that beautiful? Hebrews 10 verse 24. So you motivate your husband to do good works and to do acts of love. Motivate your wife. Motivate your kids. If you have coffee with somebody during the week, don't just sit and gossip. Motivate each other to acts of love and good works. So let your conversation around your coffee at the shed or true living or black sheep or at wimpy. Oh, wimpy can't make coffee, eh? For goodness <laughs> sake. We'll edit that out the video, eh? <laughs> Motivate each other. Motivate each other. Is your and my responsibility under the new covenant? 
to motivate each other to acts of love and good works. It's beautiful. Hebrews 10.25, and Stefan picked up on it just now, and I didn't tell him what I was preaching about. But he said, Hebrews 10.25, you're my responsibility in the new covenant. Listen to this one. Do not neglect meeting together. That's our responsibility under the new covenant. Do not neglect meeting together. Which means, <laughs> now I've got the microphone and I've got a bit of license because it's not me, it's the word of God. So I love these occasions. I love this. Which means Sundays are critical for you and I. Sundays are important, eh? Because this is where iron sharpens iron. This is where we can get an opportunity to motivate each other to acts of love and good works. So Sundays have got to be literally be number one on my priority list for the week. That I do every effort I can to be on a Sunday. Why? No, not just to look at my pretty face and to hear me talk. No, but to be able to rub shoulders with each other. Because the Bible says don't neglect meeting together. It's important because man needs man. Humans need each other. And sometimes you're out on your business or your farm or you're traveling or whatever it might be, and you're not in a community of believers. But Sunday, you can't wait to get to your mates, have a cup of coffee with them and start talking and saying, hey, how did you think? How was your week? Can I motivate you to acts of love and good works? Ah, ha, ha. And all of a sudden, things start to change. So the Bible says, you're in my responsibility under the new covenant is not to neglect meeting together. Cool, eh? Which means I try and make Sundays, well, I know. <laughs> try and make Sundays a priority, eh? Stefan's laughing, eh? So we don't neglect meeting together, but to encourage each other continually. Hebrews 10, 29, this is a good one. What is our responsibility under the new covenant is to no longer sin. Go and read it. Hebrews 10, verse 29. Let us no longer sin. Listen to this. This is the Bible. Maybe I must read it out of the Bible, and then you guys know that I'm not... Oh. Okay, I'm not going to read it. I'm sorry. These things. Are... I got myself knotted with my glasses. Hebrews 10, and I've written it here. Sinning under the new covenant. Under the new covenant. Understanding what Jesus bought, your redemption, reconciliation by his blood, Jesus chose to die for you and I so that we can be reconciled to the Father. Under that new covenant, he says we no longer sin because sinning in the new covenant is like trampling on the Son of God. It is like treating the blood of Jesus as unholy and common. That's what sin does. Treats the blood of Jesus as unholy and common. And you know what else it does? It insults the Holy Spirit. Read it. Hebrews 10, verse 29. I'm not making it up. When you and I sin under the new covenant, it's an insult to Holy Spirit. We're trampling on the holy, holy blood of Jesus and we're treating it as common after he gave himself for you and I freely. He died in our place. Yet we absolutely just discard it and we continue to live a life under my own terms. New covenant. I don't live life under my own terms any longer. Hebrews 10.35. I'm going to lift the mood a little bit. Do not throw away your confident trust. Our responsibility in the new covenant is to confidently trust in God. To endure patiently. And to do God's will. And I've often asked you, what does God say to you about your family, your place of business, whatever it might look like? What is God saying to you personally in your sphere of influence? Then do it. God might be saying something different to Ryan than he is saying to, to Hannes at the back. He could be saying something totally different. But if you want to know what God's will is, you need to be studying the Word. You need to be spending time with the Master. Spending time with him starts to understand what my role and responsibility is and what is my specific task that he's got for me to do. And in Hebrews it says that our responsibility under the new covenant is to do the will of God. If you don't know what's the will of God for your life, ask him. Ask him. Ask him. 
Why can you ask him? Because we can freely go to his throne room in our time of grace and mercy. We can. And the Bible tells us that he will give us what we need. Now I'm talking about a new car. Please, guys. I trust we are past the immature stages of Christianity. We're now into the meaty stuff. Am I right? So when we're talking about where, where the book of, one of the books in the Bible. And ask that one, Arietta. Um, where it says that if you abide in me and my word abide in, abides in you, ask whatever you want in my name and my Father will give it to you. You know that one? John, thank you. So, the critical part to that scripture is not the ask whatever you want in my name and my Father will give it to you. That's not the critical part. The first part, abide in me. Let my word abide in you. If that happens, then you can ask. Why? Because we start to ask with the right motives. Then I'm not going to ask for a new car. Then I'm not going to ask for those things. I'm going to ask, Father, I need Credoc saved. Abide in me and let my word abide in you. Hebrews 10, 39. Another responsibility we have is do not turn away from God to your own destruction. Which means do not turn away from God. If you've tasted, you've seen, don't turn away. Don't turn away. It's our responsibility. And in 1039 it says, remain faithful. That is your and my responsibility under the new covenant. Um, I feel I've got five minutes and I feel like I've got another half an hour on my preach. I want to give you a little bit more truth very quickly. I thought this was critical. I was driving to church this morning with Jeannie and I felt Holy Spirit saying something. So I popped into the office and I added some extra notes very quickly. It's to understand my identity and my position under the new covenant. My identity, and if we sang that song, and I point at the screen, sorry, but when we sang that song, God, you're so good. Remember that one part he says, I am healed, I'm restored, I am, I am, I am. That is who you and I are under the new covenant. It is not the reality of life that I can see around me. It is what does he say I am? And who does he say I am? That is my identity. My identity is I'm saved, I'm healed, I'm restored, I'm reconciled, I am a son of God, I am grafted into his family, John 15, nothing can take me out. I am an heir with Jesus Christ of God's glory and so much more. That is who I am. That is my identity. And that is where I live. That is where I live. Matthew, (laughs) Holy Spirit keeps reminding me of things and I forget where they are. Somewhere in the book of Matthew, 16 or 20, I'm not sure. Where the Bible says clearly, he says, don't let anybody call you rabbi, which means pastor or teacher. He says, don't let anyone call you teacher, because you only have one teacher in heaven. Don't let anyone call you father, because you only have one father in heaven. And that's why I've been quite adamant. Please do not call me pastor. The Bible says, do not let anyone call you rabbi. Rabbi means pastor. Don't call me that, because you only have one rabbi, and that's your rabbi in heaven, your teacher in heaven. It is God. It is Jesus. So you live according to him and not according to me, because I'm just mere mortal. Make sense? And that's why there are some religious denominations that insist on calling them Dwemini or Father. We don't do that. The Bible tells us clearly, Jesus said it. He said it very clearly. Don't let anyone call you. Why did I tell you that? I don't know. My identity. My identity. That's what it is. Because my identity is not in what I do, it is in who I am. Our pastor, that is my job, that is what I do. You're a farmer. If you're going to call me pastor, I'm going to start calling you farmer. If you're a mechanic, I'm going to start calling you mechanic. So, hey mechanic, how are you doing? Because that's what you do, not who you are. My identity is in Christ. Your identity is in Christ. You and I, brothers and sisters, are grafted in. We are equal. We are the same. There is no hierarchy in the new covenant. We are all equal. I've, uh, I might have shown you guys an illustration. And gee, I, I, yeah. when, when Holy Spirit drops something into me, 
while I'm talking to you, I have to share it because I just feel it's important. Okay. So we understand that, that um, uh, Bible um, or denominational, uh, sorry, thank you, religion is often shown in a triangle. And you get the upright triangle, which is um, people at the top telling everybody else what to do. It's kind of a democratic view, am I right? We chose these guys as leaders, but they dictate and tell us what to do. Okay? And we see some church models like that. Then we get an upside-down triangle where the people tell the leaders what to do. They will vote and they will tell you, no, no, we don't like what you're preaching. We don't like the way you're doing that. We want you to change. The people dictate. That's a democratic view. My apologies, I said it wrong just now. This way is more like a socialist or a communistic view where the leaders dictate and tell everybody else what to do. Okay? Socialist state, communism state, this is a democratic view where people tell the leaders what they want and the leaders have to do it. The biblical vision is a triangle flat on the ground like this. Flat on the ground simply means that you and I, there is no hierarchy. We are all traveling in the same direction. Some might be further on their walk. Others might, might, be, might be you know, just saved. But at the end of the day, the biblical model is a triangle that is flat on the ground showing that there is no hierarchy in the kingdom of heaven and that everybody is on the same journey and that we are all considered the same. We are all brothers and sisters in Christ. Isn't that beautiful? I absolutely love that picture because it just takes out, first of all, it takes pressure off of leaders. Because I'm just like you. And the things that you do, I do the same. Maybe sometimes I do them even more than you do. I'm going to get naughty here. So, understanding my identity. The second one that Holy Spirit reminded me of this morning in the car was position. So first I must remember what's my identity under the new covenant and what is my position under the new covenant. I am seated in heavenly places with Jesus. That's where I'm seated. So I function from heaven to earth. And it's a mind shift because we start to think, but I'm physically living here. What does it mean? I live with Jesus. I'm seated with him in heavenly places. I start to think like heaven. I respond to situations like heaven would, like Jesus would. And I bring that mentality to earth. So that when I'm faced with opposition and I'm faced with issues, I know that there used to be a rubber band people wore, what would Jesus do? I didn't particularly like that. But, but at the end of the day, I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I function from heaven to earth. I am bringing the kingdom of God, which we've been speaking about this whole year, in my behavior, in the way I speak and act and, and respond to situations. I'm bringing heaven to earth. So when I'm Dion at work and I've got a client and he's upset and he's like, whatever, whatever. how do I respond? The first thing I can do is I can defend myself and say, oh, come on, man, you bought it. You... No, 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 no. Hold on. I'm bringing kingdom to earth. I'm... So I bring the attitude of heaven to earth, to the situation around me. I might have a boss that is horrible and ugly. Bring kingdom to earth, friends. I might have a spouse that I'm struggling with. Bring kingdom to earth. Don't allow our own corrupted heart to dictate how we live and what we do and how we respond to situations. I'm seated. Please say it with me. I am seated in heavenly places. So I bring heaven to earth. You and I have got an amazing advantage to bring the kingdom of God into situations you're on earth and see them dissolved. Start living where you are positioned and your identity of who you are. 